Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the Data Science and Healthcare webinar conducted by the Manipal Global Academy of Data Science. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes explaining what the Academy does, and then I'll introduce our host and sort of explain what he's going to take you through. Um, so the Manipal Global Academy of Data Science is a new addition to the Manipal family, and we focus, as you can get from the name, primarily on data science. We teach analytics programs like HR analytics, IoT, banking, etc. And um, I'm just going to take you through a couple of slides of what we do. So we offer a full suite solution in data science. Uh, we do train on various uh, tools, etc., like R, S, 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 Hadoop, Quick, and Tableau. Uh, we have three major ways that we sort of communicate this information. One is through our open calendar analytics programs, where these are basically in the, uh, face, um, in the format of face-to-face -face analytics programs, where people do come to our academy and are trained on specific modules like HR analytics, banking analytics, etc. Another module we do have is the corporate boot camp, where organizations communicate their requirements to us, and we create customized modules for organizations based on their requirements. However, our flagship program is the PG Diploma in Data Science, where we have a rigorous 11-month PG Diploma in Data Science awarded by Manipal University. We've partnered with various corporations, including Experian, Genpact, and IBM to formulate this program. And it's an 11-month program, which does have an internship and capstone project at the end. Um, okay, so now on to the chief topic of today. Um, let me just take a few seconds to introduce Karthik Desikan. He's a data science evangelist with Manipal Hospitals. He is an IIT IIM graduate who speaks four languages, including French. He was ranked third in the CBSC Gulf Physics Olympiad. He has been with Manipal for about five years now, and he is very passionate about data science and analytics. Uh, so that's kind of what he's going to be covering today. Uh, right now, there's a lot of noise in the industry. So this webinar will help us by telling you exactly what data science does and what the capabilities uh, we have in this industry are right now. So uh, during, over the course of the webinar, he will be going through some of the statistical methodologies we use, um, explain data science concepts as they pertain to healthcare, explain the various problems various uh, stakeholders in the industry face, and what are the problems data science specifically can help fix using live case studies as examples? Um, after all this, we will have a five to ten minute uh, and uh, five to ten minutes at the end for a Q and A session. So please do hold on to all your questions till then. You can use the chat box to sort of communicate your questions with us, and Karthik will take them at the end. Um, there is a full screen option that you can use to sort of magnify everything. And now I will we'll be passing you on to Karthik. So hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar. So I'm going to be talking about uh, how the impact of data science in healthcare. So we have seen that uh, data science has made a huge impact in various sectors, such as e-commerce and retail. And you have a lot of uh, really large e-commerce companies that have made a lot of money and have changed the way we deliver, uh, have products and services all across in uh, those sectors like e-commerce, uh, tourism, and so on. But uh, there is a lot of hype and uh, there is a lot of uh, expectations that people have that data science can have the same amount of impact in healthcare. So in this webinar, we'll try and uh, observe some of the things, uh, whether, whether it's true and, and what are the kind of use cases that, that data science has actually made an impact so far in uh, healthcare. So a uh, little bit about uh, the place where I work, which is Manipal Hospitals. Um, so we are India's third largest healthcare provider for in, in terms of beds. And uh, our flagship hospital is in Bangalore, but we are spread across India. And we also we have two international uh, locations, uh, namely Malaysia and Nigeria. So let's see what are some of the really uh, cool recent advances that have happened in artificial intelligence. So, so there's this game called Go, and it's supposed to be uh, much more complex uh, than chess. So as some of you may recall, in 1996, uh, IBM's Deep Blue AI managed to beat uh, Gary Kasparov, who was the reigning uh, chess champion. 
and uh, recently uh, as of this year uh, alphago which is google's uh, one of google's deep learning based uh, artificial intelligence system managed to be the world's best player in go and beat him very comprehensively that no one expected uh, to such a large extent so uh, ai has been making a lot of advances and also tesla which is uh, which, which has a which is an electric car and has self driving uh, mechanism called autopilot so it has done something incredible that it was able to avoid a crash so it was actually able to predict that a crash was about to happen while it was driving a car and uh, it managed to stop the car in time prevent a car from being uh, part of the collision and that's incredible that ai can have such a huge impact you know in saving human lives and we can see if that's if that is the case even in healthcare uh, there are some cautionary tales that we are having as well with artificial intelligence uh, recently there, there have been a few crashes uh, that have happened even in self driving cars sometimes it's partly the the driver's fault and some and more and two times it was the fault of the software uh and and it is also having an impact in terms of jobs where it was has uh, had to release 11000 people because and and this is self declared that it is because of automation and uh, we also had cases where people are following the gps which tells them to drive straight ahead but unfortunately they drive into a lake so i think uh, there is a lot of impact that uh, ai is having and people probably i think there is a lot we have to learn as to how to make use of ai for the betterment of uh, mankind so let's look at what data science uh, means so data science uh, today and, and this is a diagram that i really like so it kind of says that data science to to employ data science well you need to be uh, good at you need to be good at computer science you need to employ statistics in the right way and you need to truly and well understand the domain that you employed for so in e-commerce they have kind of been able to uh, make use of all, all these three facets and uh, deploy it well and uh, science as you know uh, is is all about understanding uh, developing uh, cause and effect relationships and that's kind of what uh, data science is also trying to do it's it's trying to explain things what is happening but the reason why it is uh, so impactful and we are talking about it a lot today is that uh, it's about actually uh, being able to take actions so you may not understand everything that's going on with the data that you have but you have enough to to um, to be able to uh, make some sort of assumptions and be able to deal with the vast variety of data better than you were able to do before so that's why data science today is having such a huge impact and that's why we see that it, it could have an impact in healthcare and uh, and as we know uh, under differentiating between correlation and causality is very important so that's that's like being able to say that smoking is associated with cancer but that's not exactly the same as saying that smoking causes cancer so so in healthcare as we will see that this is a very important facet that you need to be able to know that something is causing something before you can actually be very sure about what you might want to do with it be it treatments or drugs and so on okay so let's just talk uh, take a very quick example of how uh, statistical methodologies are actually very widely used in healthcare so i just want to take a very simple uh, example here of how uh, we have metrics like sensitivity and specificity so let's say that we have a very simple uh, very simple blood test a cheap blood test called fecal occult blood screen uh, test and uh, this has a possibility of uh, identifying whether certain where people have bowel cancer and endoscopy and endoscopy is an expensive procedure which costs say around 5000 rupees but there is something that will actually confirm whether a person has uh, this cancer or not so so taking this example let's say around 2030 people are involved in this test and we find that 30 people 20 plus 10 actually have this kind of cancer and the rest 2000 of them don't have this cancer and the test was able to work for uh, out of the 20 out of these 30 people and uh, the remaining 180 people which it said was uh, it which it predicted was having cancer did not actually have the cancer so we use uh, metrics like sensitivity and specificity to uh, 
give us an idea of how good this test is. So as, as you can see over here, 67% uh, of the uh, actual cancer cases were found as positive and uh, and and a high 91% of the actual negative cases were found as actually negative. So similarly, you have two other metrics called as positive predictive value, and which is about 10. So here you can see about 10% of the cases uh, it uh, was only actually uh, positive, and similarly 99.5% of the cases which it thought which the test thought was negative actually turned out to you know to be uh, negative. So, so if you go to a doctor tomorrow today and you tell them that I have a great uh, screening test and I think this works well on cancer, so he's going to ask you metrics like these, and uh, and and the key thing is don't just rely on sensitivity and specificity alone. So there's a there's a metric called as F score which gives you a combination of what is called as precision and recall. So recall is the same as sensitivity and precision is the same as what we see above us. Positive uh, predictive value, and you just apply this formula, and then you you get uh, an F score. So a really high F score is uh, one. And uh, the other way of looking at it is use something called an uh, receiver operator characteristic curve. And uh, so so basically you plot the uh, true positive rate and the false positive rate. And uh, so this line that you see over there is like the 50 percent is, is is like a random guess. And uh, so, for example, this particular thing plots it for various uh, kinds of uh, specificities and one minus uh, sensitivities and one minus specificities. And this will tell you whether uh, this is good compared to a random guess, or you can even compare it to other algorithms. So, I just want to take another quick example on uh, statistical methodologies using clinical trials. So, suppose you have a new experimental drug, and let's say that you have tested this on mouse, on, on mice, and now you want to see whether this drug is actually able to lower cholesterol levels in patients. And you take and uh, and what often you do in clinical trials is that uh, you are trying to take a sample of patients, and you want to generalize uh, decisions that you're going to make on an entire population. So let's say that uh, we have a clinic running over here, and you have eight patients who have come over there, and uh, you decide to apply a, a, a logic. Okay, so the first four you decide to assign to a group called as a treatment group, which means these four people are going to get the experimental drug that you're going to give, and the other four you choose that I'm not going to give a, a, any treatment to them. So, so you do this assignment, and then uh, you see what happens. So it turns out that uh, your one that did not get the pill has to uh, women so so what happens here is you are not comparing like to like groups and uh, also you are also not doing a randomized assignment which is which which is um, more of a uh, better standard for you to ensure that you don't that, that you are comparing like to like groups and that you are not having any sort of biases while you are doing your uh, clinical trials so let's say that you do a randomized assignment uh, of people and now you have you're doing uh, comparing uh, men with men. So so what happens over here? So this this also doesn't work simply because uh, you're told all these people that you're giving them uh, that they are on this experimental study. So the group that is not getting any treatment now uh, feels that uh, they're they're not getting the right kind of treatment. So it's likely that your control group over here is going to go for a different uh, treatment. They're going to pick some other pills. So you can't control uh, patient behavior. So hence you give something called as placebos. So you give uh, the con both the groups the, the same a pill that looks the same and probably even tastes the same, and uh, that, that the, and that's the way that you ensure that the behavior will be more more similar. And the other thing is you do something called as double blinding, where uh, the patients don't know whether they are part of the treatment group or the control group, and neither do you. So so you as the researcher also should ensure that. You have no way of uh, directly knowing it, and there is a, and you use some sort of an ID or some other way to ensure that uh, both the sides have no idea. So does that work? The, does that work for us to make a valid inference out of this uh, clinical trial? It doesn't simply because your group may also have rich people. It may also have uh, highly educated people. Hence, you are not comparing again like to like. 
so what you got to do is you have to control for differences between groups you got to ensure that uh, things like education status gender uh, fitness activities in, in fact a lot of clinical trials have been invalidated because some patients have ten, tended to be more physically active than others nutrition diet and so on so uh so this so a proper uh, study which incorporates some of these things is called as a randomized control trial and uh, and if you and, and in data science also this is considered as a gold standard for not just science but also in data science in fact in any of your applications in e-commerce and so on that would be the ideal standard for you to follow but as you can see it's very hard to find uh, two uh, like uh, like to like groups to uh, to compare with and uh, if you aren't doing that it's most likely called as an observation study through which it's very hard to uh, uh, for for you to make uh, causality inferences to say that uh, something is a, a cause of another thing so let's talk a, a little bit more about what clinical methodologies are like so you have diagnosis so if a patient walks in uh, to a doctor and uh, the doctor looks at various symptoms and complaints and maybe a couple of uh, tests that the patient has taken he comes up with what is called as a diagnosis which means he says that this there is a probability that this uh, that this person is having cancer maybe it's a 40% uh, probability that this person has cancer and maybe 30% that he has a fever and so on uh, similarly so once you determine a diagnosis then you have something called as a prognosis so that means that if this person has cancer now what is the likelihood of this person to survive is it Uh, how much time does he have? Does he have three years to survive? As per the uh, data that he does, he have is uh, is the cancer uh, at the early stage right now? Is it likely to be uh, going uh, to an advanced stage within two years? So those are the kind of decisions that doctors have to make, and these are very probabilistic. And uh, doctors also have to decide what treatment is the is the best particular uh, mechanism for this particular patient. uh what treatment is likely to have better clinical outcomes and there are many ways of looking at clinical uh, outcomes so there's things like mortality morbidity which means that is the person likely to uh, die is the person likely to have a very advanced uh, stage of the disease and so on so uh so 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 in this uh, what we'll talk about is that uh looking at the diagnostic and prognostic uh Uh, variables the uh, probability variables is is i think this is this looks a lot like your standard data science model that it that you see in statistics see the so if you look at diagnostic you have a lot of uh, predictors which are characteristics about the patient imaging uh, lab and so on so so the key difference between a diagnostic and a prognostic model is that a diagnostic model is at a point of time so if a patient walks in today the doctor has to decide what disease the patient has as as of today while a prognostic study is all about developing uh, relationships over a period of time so uh, so if you so if you want to the come up with a probability that a patient today has uh, is likely to have a, a particular uh, advanced stage of a disease 2 years from now you got to see studies of people who have been over 2 years or 3 years of time or whatever is the interval that you want to look at so so the former is called as a cross sectional relationship and the latter is called as a longitudinal relationship so another thing that you see a lot in data science is decision trees and it is uh, no surprise that doctors also use the same so if uh, so this is a a very simple looking decision tree of, of what would uh, how he would diagnose a breast cancer patient and how he would go about the treatment so we talked a bit about uh, how statistics is used very widely in healthcare so let's talk a bit about what uh, how technology has advanced as well um so a lot of things have happened computing power has increased so with with moore's law the number of uh, transistors have on a chip have doubled every 18 months and that has been going on for a long time you are now able to store a lot more data than you used to before uh, you have mobile connectivity so a, a patient can uh, can be walking around and with his mobile phone you can actually track information about the patient whether so you have variable you have like variable fit bits uh, which are tracking uh, how Uh, the fitness of a patient that is uh, in a particular place, and uh, and and also and I also need to mention cloud computing also because that has made uh, data science uh, implementations more accessible today. And the last point is about uh, graphical processing units. So GPUs 
are these special uh, graphical cards that you have and in, of course you use it for gaming normally but uh, this should use to a very uh, important application as, as what is called as deep learning so so machine learning is uh, is uh, of course a, a very key development and which is what is highly used by data scientists today so machine learning is all about uh, so earlier we looked at decision trees we looked at rules that uh, that humans have found okay they have looked at statistical models and figured out that this is probably what the decision tree is like this is the rule if if you see this then it's likely to be cancer and so on but machine learning is all about the computer being able to figure it out by itself you, the, the computer is able to understand what the rules could be and typically uh, what you do is you have uh, you give it uh, something called as label data so taking a cancer example uh, you you would give uh, a machine a set of say 100 patients and tell them that these patients have cancer and these patients don't so that's what's called as your training data and then uh, you may also have so the idea is about good machine learning algorithms is about uh, if you have a group of unseen patients how good does the algorithm perform so so that's that's a key aspect of uh, why we use machine learning today so that we can generalize over a population of unseen people so just to mention about deep learning and why it is so useful so deep learning is actually a part of something called as artificial neural networks so so the idea is you want to model how uh, signals and uh, signals and data are sent in the brain and how uh, so using that structure it's called, so that structure is called as artificial neural networks so what 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 it does is it's a, it's a basically a variant of that with uh, more hidden layers and uh, so so the the reason why uh, deep learning is so important today is that uh, researchers have found that if you add a lot more data and if you have a lot more computing power and so the so that computing horsepower today is of course gpus then you tend to have really good uh, learning algorithms that have outperformed uh, anything that you have before be it uh, linear regression logistic uh, svms and so on so so that's kind of why uh, deep learning is, is so useful and and the other thing reason that it has a lot of hype is that uh, deep learning has come into foray so much faster than we thought it was earlier so i will we'll talk a bit about uh, some of the applications of deep learning just one last point is that we talked earlier about how science is all about uh, establishing uh, relationships and about uh, causality so that's something that tends to be a little harder in deep learning so this has certain implications and that we will see later So let's talk a bit about what we mean by big data. So uh, the definition is of course pretty familiar to a lot. That it's about how you un uh, when you have a large amount of uh, data sets and which are very complex, then uh, how do you manage retrieval? How do you manage storage, searching, and so on? And uh, the dimensions also should be familiar to a lot of people. That so big. is big is in terms of volume big is in terms of variety where we'll talk about things like structured and unstructured data and you have big data that comes like really fast you have like terabytes and terabytes being uh, uh, loaded every day and uh, the questions about how good the data is really what is the quality of it so in healthcare uh, we have a wide variety of data so healthcare also is uh, has has issues with big data so for example if you, if you have a laboratory test of a patient today uh, you take a blood test and uh, so that is that is generally uh, more of a structured data which means that your your machine is able to pick it up directly it's a direct numerical value that you can assign and give it to the machine uh, similar things applies for things like age and gender and so on but if you look at images images are not exactly these are not exactly like jpeg so mri scans Uh, x-rays and so on may not always be uh, jpegs but sometimes they may be structured but more often than not they tend to be unstructured and uh, more, more importantly things like doctor notes so if you are in a hospital and you are going to spend a couple of days over there uh, a lot of notes that the doctor writes are just uh, in 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 the worst case they may be handwritten and scanned onto the system in the better cases they may be uh, a free flowing word document that you can do something with that you hope to do something with later uh so another important uh, structured data that is used in healthcare is something called as icd coding 
so so that uh, basically tells you what is the diagnosis of a particular disease so if you think it is cancer so it has a code that's something like 7.1 so that's a cancer diagnosis that is coded in the system for a particular patient so the more uh, you have data like that the more uh, 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 the more you can infer out of it out of the data that you have in your hospital uh so yes so, so this is what a uh, typical unstructured data looks like so it, it really looks like a mess of uh, so much of data data of consultation different doctors uh, history and so on so there's, there's there's really a wealth of data in here but it's very difficult to pick this out so so that's where you use something called as natural language processing so just want to take one or two very quick simple examples to tell you what what is the power of uh, natural language processing so So even a five-year-old kid can process this sentence. Okay, if he's a sentence that says Arun and Geeta are my friends, he is the best student in his class. So who who does the he refer to? So for uh, even a five-year-old child, the, the, they they may say that it's Arun, but uh, it's not so obvious for a computer. And uh, also, if you if you give this question to someone who's in the US, they're not, also not going to be able to say that whether the he is Arun or Geeta. Similarly, another example: Dayat and Vishwanathan are my friends. He is the best cricketer in the world. So who does he refer to? Is it Virat or Vishwanathan? So, so uh, unstructured data looks like this. You have a lot of text, and uh, you need to make associations between uh, data that is there, and uh, you need context. So in this case, you need context that there is a cricketer uh, that you have, that there are cricketers uh, in the world. Here is a database of them, and link it with uh, link it with the name that you see over here, and be sure that. We are actually refers to a cricketer, and so on. I mean, there may be various ways of approaching it, but uh, to to keep it uh, to to keep it simplistic, this is what NLP tries to do. And uh, so, so here's an here's a more of a medical example. So, uh, patient came in today with ongoing issues uh, with diabetic control. So, so the NLP should pick the word diabetic and say that uh, it is able to uh, that that diabetes is the condition. and if you see this example it has actually even figured out the, the icd code for this kind of diabetes and uh, so 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 that's the challenge that uh, data science and nlp have done to uh, help uh, improve our understanding of the healthcare data that we have so let's talk about what are the objectives of a healthcare system so we so we looked at uh, computer science we looked at uh, math we looked at maths and statistics so let's look at the deep dive into Healthcare, the objectives that we have in itself. Uh, healthcare systems all all about three different aspects. How do we reduce costs? How do we increase the quality of care that we can give to a patient? And how do we improve the accessibility? Which means that can we? How can we have healthcare institutions that are closer to your house? And how can we have uh, doctors who are available for you to consult? And uh, these are trade-offs. So you can have two of these things, but it's very difficult to have all three together. and uh, we will we'll kind of we will kind of look at that uh, some more examples of these in uh, some of the use cases so every stakeholder that we see today has uh, unique problems uh, hospitals are looking at how they have a limited staff of uh, doctors now how can this how can one doctor manage more patients uh, how can patients be managed better within the hospital how how can they reduce chances of infection or are uh, not catching a patient who is going to be more unwell within the hospital with the current amount of staff that they have how do you identify a patient who is suitable to be admitted to an icu so uh, some of these pro these problems are not easy because uh, it it involves a lot of co coordination with a lot of people and that's kind of where maybe data science can help patients are looking at problems from a different perspective that that you have so much of lifestyle diseases going on patients are dissatisfied because there's so much of waiting time for doctors they don't have time to even spend with the doctors and uh, tends to and things are very expensive doctors are looking at things like how do we how do they keep track of so much of research that is happening in the world today and a lot of them are even uh, not so tech savvy so how do you make data science based applications more easier for them to use uh pharma industry is looking at how to keep uh, so we look at clinical trials so clinical trials are very expensive and some clinical trials to establish causality takes about 5 to 10 years so how do you increase the speed how do you keep the cost lower insurance is looking at uh, so right now we get fairly flat insurance costs across different ages uh, but 
insurance companies are looking at how do we assess patients health in a better way so that they can we can give more fairly priced premiums how do we assess probabilities better and better and in and in india public healthcare is also uh, is, is also a big concern that we spend say only 1% of our gdp on the healthcare and we have a very limited set of uh, doctors per patient so that ratio is much lower than what the norm should be so their public healthcare decisions in terms of where do we spend our uh, healthcare budget on so there are often uh, non ai approaches that can be used to solve some of these problems so a quick so i'll just take one or two quick things from here you can use uh, telemedicine so so how do we get more uh, doctors to connect with patients so uh, tele radiology is something that is being used very lately so you have a doctor uh, sitting at a remote location and uh, you have uh, you have remote centers uh, in say villages or some other places and doctors are able to consult with these patients and uh, give up assessments and uh, help uh, and help them basically uh, we are and you also and there's also something called the remote patient monitoring where uh, you have devices which look like fitbits and these can be bps or or uh, ecg uh, you know checking heart rate and things like that so you you can have patients sitting at their home and uh, today the problem is that the doctor asks the patient to probably take a certain medicine the patient goes home and the doctor has no idea how the patient is uh, doing uh, after after the patient has left so, and there's probably a chance maybe 3 months later when the patient is probably unwell and that's why the patient came back but uh, if the doctor is able to monitor the patient while uh, uh, during this interim period then that would probably help bring down uh, uh, the cost of uh, of having the patient come there in the first place so there are many approaches that are there that are being used to solve some of these problems but let's look at how uh, these things are how data science is uh, using uh, is, is is solving some of these things so there are three uh, three basic categories that we look at um, one is from a business side what what are the opportunities for uh, hospitals or rather any healthcare uh, organization what are the opportunities for it to uh, to find more revenue so this is all about and and actually at manipal uh, i'm i'm sharing some of the work in uh, in this segment and uh, we're doing some cutting edge stuff over here which i'm actually not at liberty to reveal right now but uh, but this is a very deep problem how do you identify who are the sick patients uh, how do you and and once you once you find a particular uh, customer or patient uh, how do you assess that this person is going to be with you for a long time and uh, and uh, and uh, and we also have marketing campaign so how do you assess how good the campaign is Uh, what is the return on investment so what is the best way to do that and and some of these problems are little harder in the healthcare slightly harder in the healthcare sector compared to e-commerce is that uh, in e-commerce uh, the, the patient touch point is often on a computer patient is always on an app so there's a lot more you can understand about the, the patient behavior uh, in healthcare some of the stuff is a little harder so so once the patient is with you uh, things are a little it's a little easier to understand the health of the patient but it's but if you can if you can appreciate this it's a little harder for you to understand what a patient what a customer is like when they are not in the hospital so uh, and and there's a lot of work we've been doing on customer feedback analysis as well because that throws a lot of insights on how the uh, patients feel about uh, the hospital uh, similarly the, there is another thrust always on operation so which is about reducing cost uh so so one typical problem that hospitals have is, is that uh, a patient is advised to be in the hospital say for 5 days or 6 days but how can you use uh, how, how can you use uh, information about the patient how can you use information about the population to suggest that this patient should actually be there for uh, instead of 6 days we can reduce that to 4 days so then as a, so so the reason you can do that is that the patient is actually not as critical as uh, it seems and uh, it and and you you can have data that can suggest and help the doctor make the decision uh, and and the impact here that it has is that it frees up the beds of the hospital for more critical patients and so and and i think the i think this division is a lot about optimizing things like how are you using the machines that you have in the hospital how to reduce turnaround time how are you uh, allotting uh, the staff that you have in the hospital be it doctors be it nurses and so on and and i think there's a lot of scope even for supply chain and a lot of work is actually going on in various hospitals and the third the the the, the important thing that i'm going to be spending a lot more time in the next couple of slides about is the clinical aspect 
how do you improve patient uh, outcomes and how do you reduce the doctor workload so we we talked about uh, diagnosis prognosis uh, treatment and preventive is another important aspect how do you prevent patients from uh, having uh, diseases maybe after uh, or reoccurrences of diseases so let's just look at uh, so 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 this like this we tell you that there is in fact uh, that data science can have across various industries uh let me just briefly talk about public healthcare is is a, is a very important section where uh you can use data to actually predict to some extent that whether a, a particular uh there is going to be an outbreak of a particular disease like dengue or something else or uh, to understand what areas in the country require an, a different kind of intervention and so on so So, I, so basically, uh, across various sectors, I think there's a lot of impact, and I shall just probably get straight to some of the use cases. So, the, so I'll be looking at a variety of business use cases, and mostly business and clinical uh, use cases over here. So, at Manipal, uh, this is something very interesting that we have done. So, how do we reduce uh, patient dissatisfaction? So, uh, so typically, uh, you have a patient who stays in the hospital for a couple of days, and at the end, uh, they fill up a form where they either say that yes they are they are happy with the, the the overall service or they were not happy so that's called an nps uh, net promoter score question and that kind of helps uh, most institutions understand whether they are uh, and what is the nature of the uh, loyalty that uh, the customers have with them so 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 what we did is that uh, the, the, we did a lot of analysis of the feedback forms that were there and we could and and you know about the typical feedback form that we have has about 35 questions and uh, using data science we were able to uh, find seven key questions that could uh, that could give around an 80% uh, accuracy as to whether the patient uh, would give us a high score or not for uh, the for the nps question and uh, we were able to deploy this because uh, during the stay of the hospital while the patient so if the patient is there for four days in the hospital in the second day itself we could give them these six seven questions for them to fill up and uh if they give us a low score then we would likely to know that yes uh, there there are some issues with this patient and this patient is likely to uh be a detractor by the end of the uh, uh, stay in the hospital so an, so another thing that we have done is we have worked with this company called as healthify me where uh, patient uh, pa patients are given an app so so they are they are asked to uh, follow a certain diet uh say maybe you have to have a low sodium diet and there are certain kinds of food that you are supposed to eat so uh, we have patients going home with the app and logging in information about what food they ate so if i know that you have milk with uh, sugar i know home, so so then there is a database that can tell you how many what are the vitamins that are there how much of it is uh, fats how much of and how many calories that it has so it's a very detailed break up of the food is available similarly uh, patients also are given uh, fitbit like devices so we get to know uh, how much uh, they have exercised what is the activity that they have done in the day so you are able to link uh, calories that are taken in by the body and calories that are expended by uh, exercise or any sort of physical activity and understand and the algorithms that can basically determine whether the patient is adhering to the diet plan that is given to them whether they are adhering to a diet plan are they on track to lose say 5 kilos or whatever it is that is the goal of the whole uh, diet exercise Okay, so uh, so so now let's talk about cancer. So cancer is a very serious problem in the country. That uh, that six percent of all deaths, in fact, in India are due to cancer. And, uh, and 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 as you can see on the right, that there are a lot of cancers in India that are more evident than others, like breast cancer, cervical for women. And so 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 the point is that cancer deaths are very serious in India, and it is the third most. It is the third most. Uh, a uh, non communicable disease uh, cause for death and uh, one problem that cancer patients often have is that if if you don't have so so if you are a cancer patient you are given a treatment advised by a doctor that this is the first thing that you must do and a lot of times uh, patients are not convinced whether that first step that the doctor suggests is the best so that's kind of where we have uh, uh, used something called as ibm watson So Watson is a technology platform. So IBM owns uh, Watson, and uh, we talk about natural language processing and machine learning. So this is a system that has a lot of uh, that uses natural language processing and machine learning to look at the unstructured data 
that is available of, about the patient. So, Watson as a system has a lot of uh, has been used in various industries, and in fact, it, uh, look, looking at this slide, it has even it's been used to analyze uh, Twitter and Facebook feeds of a of a particular person, and it can tell you then what is the personality, is it is he a jovial personality, and so on. So, and and it can even be used to answer questions uh, in the form of chatbots. So, uh, we are the first hospital in India and the second across the world to use this system, and. One of the problems that doctors has is that, has, is that uh, there are about 120 new cancer uh, papers published every day, and that makes it really difficult for them to keep track with the research that is going on. So Watson is a system, uh, Watson for Oncology for Cancer Patients is a system that has been trained by uh, doctors from Memorial Sloan Kettering. So that's like the number two cancer hospital in the world. And, uh, it, and, and it has also looked at a lot of literature. So the training data is from doc doctors uh, the patient cases from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and it also has a lot of medical content. It has uh, used NLP to look at medical textbooks, research journals, and so on. So, what does what does that get us? Uh, so, if a patient walks in today, uh, the system can look at uh, all, all of these textbook data. It can look at all of the training data that has been provided by Memorial Sloan Kettering, and it can actually tell you uh, what are the most recommended treatments that should be provided for the patient. So, I'll just take an example over here. So if a patient walks in and uh, we enter some structured data with the patient, like lab values, and we put in a lot of unstructured data. Uh, so for example, the, in this example, it, it says that there is a 7.4 hypochloric irregular mass. So it can actually, using NLP, can actually derive that uh, what is the actual size. And this is a more trivial example, but they're more uh, advanced examples of where it uses the unstructured data to fill up a lot of data that is available over here. And this is uploaded into Watson, and Watson comes back and says that this patient should undergo chemotherapy followed by surgery and followed by so on and so forth. And it gives you a ranked list of treatment options. So in green over here, uh, what you see is the most uh, recommended option by Watson. And it, it tries to, uh, and, and it does this based pretty much on what Memory Sloan Kettering advises. So, if you walk into Memorial Sloan Kettering in USA today, uh, this is what the doctor would suggest to you that this is the most, uh, the, the green option is the most recommended option. And then you have a list of options in orange, which are also called as poor consideration. And then there are some options that are not as good, uh, simply because may, maybe the patient has a history of cardiac disease. So there are certain drugs that are not at all considered for the patient. And it can tell you to some extent, it can give you a rational that why this particular treatment is useful for uh, a certain set of patients like this. So uh, deployment of uh, solutions like Watson for Oncology and other such machine learning systems is all about not just deploying, but you also need to evaluate how good it is. So, so we have done a, a concordant study to understand how good are Watson recommendations versus those by uh, our own doctors. And so there was a publication in 2016 where we have found that 90% of the recommendations by Watson were uh, concordant with the recommendations of our doctors. So I talk about deep learning. So deep learning, uh, where it really feels, you know, deep learning is something which I said is very useful because you have vast computing power and you have a lot more data that was not available uh, earlier. So deep learning especially has a lot of uh, implications for diagnosis based. Uh, uh, algorithms. So, so for diabetic patients, uh, there's a disease called as diabetic retinopathy, which means that uh, you could have uh, there's a chance you could go blind, and and uh, about 70 million patients in India are at risk because of this. And and the problem here is that you have very few uh, doctors, ophthalmologists who are specialists in in uh, detecting this disease in patients. So, and and uh, with with this high amount of workload, it is very difficult for us to for the doctors also to always be right on this particular thing, there's a chance of having fatigue and errors can also happen. So Google's uh, algorithm for deep learning is so good that they, they so, so we talked about the F-score metric earlier for uh, measuring how good a test is. So Google's algorithm has an F-score of 0.95, which is actually better than the median score of uh, the eight ophthalmologists in the study that they conducted. So. Um, so you can see that machine learning algorithms are coming on par with doctors in some of these uh, in some of the applications. So another so I just want to talk about another use case. 
So for diabetic patients, uh, there is a condition called as hypoglycemia, which means you can have very low blood sugar. And uh, so Medtronic uh, is a company which has which has an uh, app, and it can actually tell the patient. So so if if the patient fills in data that uh, they have eaten food at this particular time and so on, it it can actually and 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 uh, it actually has a uh, an implanted device that is put onto the patient, which is actually monitoring the blood sugar level. So it can actually uh, use this data to uh, come up with a trend and predict that this person is a very likely to have hypoglycemia. And if you have a hypoglycemia, then it's a, it's, then it's a very uh, let's call it a very bad condition for diabetic patients. So we talk about uh, clinical use cases like prognosis, diagnosis, uh, rather more on diagnosis and prevention. So this is a prognostic model. So don't worry about the contents on the screen. Uh, so we have something called Q-Risk, which is an, an algorithm that can predict whether you are going to have cardiovascular disease in the next 10 years. And uh, for this particular example that I have taken and put a screenshot over here, the, uh, the this is a smoke this is a smoker with certain diseases like atrial uh, fibrillation and migraines and so on. So he has a chance of uh, of 23% uh, chance of having a heart attack in the next 10 years. So. So, so you have a lot of models like these. There's something called Frankenstein score for also predicting heart attacks and so on. So these are actually very widely used in the industry. And and in fact, uh, developing these models are pretty difficult. So I'll just talk about that in a bit. So the last use case that I will be talking about is uh, used in a hospital in New York. Now we we now reducing. So so uh, for hospitals in US, it is very important to reduce uh, readmissions. That's because the insurance providers may uh, actually uh, reject claims if they feel that there is a high amount of readmissions that the hospitals are having. And in India also, this is important because the, you, you want to reduce the amount of chance that a patient can have of having a particular infection. So you want to improve the quality of care. So there are a lot of, so this is a very widely used problem in the US where you have statistical models that can actually predict whether the patient uh, should come back to the hospital now or not. So you can prevent unnecessary patients from uh, patients from unnecessarily having to come back to the hospital or you can bring them in at the right time. So just to summarize a couple of points, what are the important things that you must ask about before you use uh, data science in healthcare? So from an organization perspective, you need to ask yourself, is this a business or a clinical problems? And uh, based on that, you will understand who is the right person to use this uh, use the solution. And even at our hospital, it's not a very trivial uh, so a question for us, we have to ask ourselves a lot, are doctors actually going to use this? Is it easy for them to use this particular thing? Are the, is the IT system and the, and the tools that they have with them, uh, is it integrated well? Uh, is it easy for them to click on things even? So you, you have to go to uh, such a level of detail before you can deploy any such solution. And in for, and more for for-profit models, uh, you look at a business case. You want to know what is the ROI? Do you have a particular... Uh, is, is there a particular uh, ROI that you're going to have? In, are you going to expect more patients to come in? Are you going to be able to reduce costs? You need to look at various things. And you need to look at uh, medical legal guidelines. Is it is this, uh, is this it ethical to take this particular data? Uh, do you have concerns of the patient before you use the data for certain reasons? And, maintain, and you have to maintain, of course, patient privacy and so on. From a more of a statistical perspective, you need to look at things like, what is the source of the training data? So a lot of training data, Maybe uh, patients may be self-reporting that yeah, I have diabetes, but that, that may not be good enough. You need to look at actual uh, data where the doctor has labeled that this particular patient has had diabetes and so on. So, so that, is, you know, that is one problem that you have in healthcare that it is very difficult to get uh, good data sets uh, from doctors. And like I said, you also need consent from patients for uh, using various kinds of data sets. And uh, today, there's, there, there is a lot of doubt about the standards that different, uh, about the way the data is stored in different hospitals. So there's something called HL7, which allows you to uh, transfer medical data between different institutions. But uh, I would say on the whole that a lot of data across hospitals is a little difficult to, uh, you can't just use it ad hoc. You need to do a lot of processing on it and hopefully then it turns out to be right. And uh, we talk about prognostic models. So the reason that prognostic models take a lot of time uh, is that it is very that that you need to establish cause and effect relationships before you can actually say that the model is good. 
So we've seen a lot of advances lately, more in terms of diagnosis, more than prognosis, and it's actually no surprise uh, why that is so. Uh, and 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 there are a lot of very important considerations from an organization perspective. Do you is the data? So so suppose you take a model. There's a there's a model that has been trained on a specific set of data. Now you bring this into a second institution. Now is that data? Uh, now is the data in that hospital good enough for uh, using this particular uh, solution? And you, and in fact, for profit uh, models, you have to look at things like who's going to pay for the solution. That is it going to escalate to the patients? Are the patients actually going to pay for it? And you need to and just like you need to consider uh, uh, bringing in uh, data to a different institution, you also need to look at is it applicable for maybe a different state or different country's uh, population as well. So one of the last things I'll talk about is genomics. I'm uh, self I'm not I'm not a self confessed expert at all in genomics, but there are some key things that uh, why it, uh, genomics is actually uh, will play a big role in and has already been playing a big role in healthcare today. So in 2003, there was a big milestone where uh, the human genome was mapped, the entire human genome, and uh, it, so it turns out that certain uh, genes, if they mutate, if they if they change differently from what uh, they are supposed to be, then it is an indicator. It is an indicator that uh, it these might uh, that these might be causing or be related to certain diseases. So there's a lot of research that is employed today. So a uh, lot of people have heard about Angelina Jolie, how she underwent mastectomy because uh, she had a positive BRCA1 gene mutation test. So that was increased her risk of having breast cancer. So there's a lot of uh, linkage happening nowadays between uh, uh, genes and uh, diseases, and that is, of course, uh, having a lot of impact. And uh, to actually understand the gene of a particular person, you do gene sequencing. And today, this is getting faster and becoming cheaper. So today, even at sixty thousand, it's a little expensive, but uh, these costs are coming down, and it will become easier for uh, more profitable for people. So what it means is that you can have truly personalized uh, treatment. So a lot of treatment that you have today is based on uh, generalizations that you do from a population, but. But, but but there is potential that you can have a truly personalized uh, treatment for the patient, and uh, obviously uh, this is a, and, and uh, it's no it is no surprise that a lot of pharma companies are in fact buying uh, gene uh, genetic company genomics companies biotech companies because they because of the linkage of drugs to uh, genes and diseases. So one of the last things I just want to end up with is a clip from uh, one of my all time favorite movies called Ketaka. So this is a future. This is a look into the future where just a blood sample can uh, tell you what is your life expectancy uh, seconds, literally seconds after you are born. So on that note, uh, let's hope for a healthier future with data science and all. So I think we can open the forum for questions now. So, uh, so I have a question here from Pooja. So so the question is, in cases of unique gene targeted cancer drugs. It takes time for drug makers to figure out why certain tumors are resistant to their drugs. Unfortunately, before a modified drug comes out for clinical trials, patients are no more uh, to undergo the next clinical trial. So, how can this latency to launch drugs and uniqueness to gene mutations be addressed? So, uh, and I think she also comments that it's a both a business and clinical issue, right? So, I, this is a very interesting question and. Uh, I think the short answer that I'd like to give to this is that uh, clinical trials are extremely important, and uh, and uh, there, there are implications, right? You uh, okay? Let, let's say that you are uh, doing a marketing campaign for an e-commerce brand, and 
you you probably pushed a notification of a particular ad to the to the person the most of the person is going to do is swipe it but uh, in in clinical trials the implications are i think far more severe and uh, it has to go it, it it does have to go through a certain cycle of uh, patients uh, a certain a certain number of years and a certain amount of time to establish that there is a cause and effect relationship so it's it's not easy to uh, it's really not easy to reduce this latency and uh, patients do die patients do die of during uh, clinical trials and i think what data science is uh, one of the things that it is being used for today is that it is able to uh, find suitable patients so so it's imp- like i said it's important to find a good uh, a good uh, group to compare with so data science can help us find more patients in the country that are actually suitable for the particular trial so that's like one thing that i can think of so i, I hope i've uh, addressed that question Okay, so next we have a question from uh, Chandra Kant. Uh, she wants to know what type of models uh, do we use? So, uh, so we use data science in two ways in the hospital. So, there's some amount of uh, data science that is used uh, that we uh, use uh, directly. Like, like I myself code some of these models in, and there's a lot of work that is, of course, done by uh, companies that uh, we associate with. So, for example, some of the work that we have done uh, with uh, I am Bangalore. So, so the So the presentation that we saw on customer feedback analysis is, is research work that uh, we have collaborated with IM Bangalore. So that used something like logistic regression, and uh, what does uh, Watson use? Watson uses a lot of natural language processing. So um, I, I would say that actually the, the the best model is suitable for the problem. It, it depends on the problem that you're looking at. You need to look at what is the problem that you have in mind. You know, accordingly, I think you will find the appropriate uh, model for the uh, particular. Uh, Okay, so I, I see a question from Akhil, uh, which is, can Watson also reveal the survival rate of a cancer patient? So yes, that is one of the statistics. In fact, that uh, Watson gives it. It tells a patient. It actually tells the doctors that uh, there is that the two-year survival rate of the patient is X percent. The five-year and ten-year survival rate of the patient is this and so on. So yes, uh, Watson is actually able to do that because it picks the most relevant uh, medical journals that it can find. And it is able to tell the patient, uh, tell the doctor that this is the survival rate for uh, likely survival rate of this patient. So this is a uh, question from uh, Ramesh Babu: As how can data science uh, help directing patients away from higher costs, uh, higher risk settings, uh, and eliminate treatments that are uh, ineffective? so this is in fact uh, a lot of data science models a lot of stuff that i talked about earlier are looking at uh, this so let's take the example of hospital readmissions so uh, you want to prevent hosp- uh, patients from coming back to a hospital too early and uh, and and obviously these and uh, these will this will reduce costs for the patient and uh, in- increase the amount of beds available for the patients so uh your question from jairam so the question is as an aspiring data scientist who wants to work in the healthcare sector which particular areas of study should i focus on uh compared to uh data scientists working in other fields so so i think this is an interesting question uh this so it depends on what applications of uh, healthcare uh Sector you want to look at. So, if you want to look at business problems, then I I think that uh, if you read up on uh, information on healthcare models or talk to people who who are working in uh, healthcare sector, I think you will get a lot of knowledge as to how to build uh, models for that. But if you want to build clinical models, then I think it 
a lot of these uh, you you will need to involve uh, experts. You will need to spend some time looking at. Uh, so you can look at Coursera for uh, things like biostatistics, so that you understand different kinds of clinical trials. You can understand different kinds of uh, healthcare data. So I, I talked about a few things like uh, images and lab reports, but there are also things like so EC, your ECG, uh, for example, uh, are waveforms. Then uh, then there are something called fMRI scans, which are also different kinds of waveforms and so on. So so it depends on what is the problem that you're looking at, and uh, de depending on that, I think you will find uh, different things that you can definitely uh, study. So I, I see a question from uh, Java Govind. So what do you think about Microsoft AI and cognitive uh, services in healthcare space? Uh, any comparison between IBM Watson and Microsoft cognitive tools? So so here's the thing. I think uh, I haven't really seen. I haven't really looked looked at uh, what uh, uh, some of the cognitive tools, much of the cognitive tools of Microsoft. So Microsoft, of course, has Azure. And uh, in general, I mean, in, in general, it has a lot of uh, good things which makes it comparable uh, to the offerings of IBM, Watson, and also to uh, some of Google's APIs as well. And specifically for healthcare space, I can't say. But, uh, and, but I think I, I did see that they have a blog post where they have used it for uh, certain, I think, I think there were some certain predictive models for that. But it's but it's hard to but, but I, I can't give you an offhand comparison. I have not really analyzed it. Does Manipal use? Uh, so this is a question from uh, Peter. Uh, does Manipal use existing data to predict a disease? Say, for example, uh, cardiac. So I I can't immediately think of. Uh, of an example, a very good example to say where where uh, software is being used to predict the disease, but I would say that doctors, like I said, are very analytical, and and for doctors, it's it's all about using uh, prognostic or prognostic or diagnostic models. So doctors do look at. Uh, so if if you go to say a cardiologist today, he uses a uh, Feynman score or Q-risk score or one of those things, and Maybe he put, maybe he puts it in the system. Maybe he does it on on paper, or maybe it's the, the looking at your information. It's very he can tell you very quickly that yes, this looks like a high score. He doesn't have to probably calculate the exact score. So doctors do use this all the time, and uh, I think you will see slowly more and more models which are becoming so sophisticated where uh, you you do need uh, you will need you will need a software to build in to use to input probably twenty thirty parameters. So. So Watson, for example, doesn't predict the disease, but Watson, for example, is telling you what is the likelihood that this uh, cancer is going to become more advanced or is going to uh, cause a death in a couple of years. Death in a couple of years. So I would say it kind of depends on the use cases. So it's a question from uh, Vijaya Krishna. So can uh, machine learning and neural networks resolve issues in uh, in the large data sets, so slightly generic question, I would say, but uh, uh, yes, I think uh, I think I think that is the whole uh, point why um, machine learning and neural networks have been deployed more. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about uh, deep learning, for example. So deep learning is all about the fact that uh, the more data that you use, the more li the, the more uh, likely that your prediction is going to be better than the other uh, algorithms that you have, and uh, so, so probably when you look at what are the issues with large data sets, you may have issues like quality and so on. So there's some. So I think you need to do a lot of pre-processing on your data and understand it better before you deploy it. So another question is: uh, Is Watson in any way going to diminish the role of uh, doctors in future? Uh, I don't think so. I think at our own hospitals, our doctors are using it daily on patients, and in fact, it gives them more confidence that. Uh, the uh, recommendations that they're giving for the patients are going to be uh, useful for them, and will improve their and improve the outcomes for the patient. So, I don't think uh, doctors' role. I, I think the 11,000 jobs that we saw of uh, infosys. I don't think you're going to see such an issue for doctors anytime soon. Uh, so, this is a nice question from Akhil Teja. So, uh, where can I find public data sets of Indian hospitals? So not many uh, Indian hospitals today do give out public data sets. So that's that's hard. That's a, that's I think an open problem. I think uh, we need some sort of a consortium where uh, hospitals 
are incentivized in some way to share data sets and uh, i think that's pretty difficult and i don't think you have any good uh, uh, clinical data sets of uh, indian patients anywhere and uh, you, you i think you find a lot of uh, clinical data sets of patients in uh, us and uk and so on and uh, but i think indian hospitals nothing right now and it's i think going to be pretty hard you'll have to uh, find a, if, if you want to build a model with a hospital i think you need to meet them and uh, sign an nda with them and do a private uh, have a private way of uh, using the data set is there, so another question from jyoti prakash is there any centralized data storage of all the patients in india do we even follow that kind of storage so sadly there isn't any centralized data storage and uh, uh, so so there is so a body formed by uh, the indian uh, government called as uh, neha so that stands for the national e health authority so this body uh, is is actually a group of uh, 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 hospitals pharma companies medical uh, device companies uh, healthcare it companies and uh, public hospital uh, public and government hospital staff so the idea here is that they are trying to have a centralized format so we don't even have a centralized format today that all the hospitals are following be it uh, private or public so if you don't have a proper format in the first place then uh, it is difficult to talk about things like how can you store all of this data together and uh, i think it's, it's it's a hard problem because patient data uh, because, because patient data is uh, after all very private to a person and you don't want that to get leaked out so there are security and privacy concerns and another reason why you don't have much of data storage is that uh, there's too much of uh, unstructured data and suppose you are a hospital today that wants to become more data friendly uh, i think there's a lot of money you have to there's going to be a lot of investment in your it to do that and uh, there aren't uh, and and i think there there are definitely models for business models for hospitals that they can follow today to probably see why it is good to do that but i think also different hospitals have different priorities and uh, our hospital has been slightly we've been slightly fortunate that a lot of data that we have in our hospital is pretty good for doing some sort of uh, analysis so uh, we have a question here so uh, from ankit which is uh, how can you say nps score will determine the health of services uh, it is highly influential on the severity of disease and treatment effects so um, nps is is a very uh, widely used metric across uh, industries to determine whether a customer is happy or not now uh, we don't look at uh, the now the question of, of, as we mentioned earlier is that uh the nps question is that would you uh, highly recommend this particular brand to your friends and family and so on and someone who's happy will give a very high score and uh, someone who's not happy will give a much lower score so this is the score is by the way between 0 and 10 now the 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 the, the reason that uh, we use this very well is that it's it's convenient and it's a very simple single metric that you can use however you're right that i you're right you're right to some extent that uh it is difficult to necessarily say that this is the only determinant we do have other questions in the whole feedback which are clinical so there are questions which are like right, uh did the were, you know was the did the doctor explain things to you well uh was the nursing staff good was there some issue with the food did you feel uh, comfortable during your whole stay so we don't just look at the nps score to say that yes it is good or bad alone but but i think it, uh, so so if you uh, look at in fact the, some of the questions that determine uh, whether uh, someone is getting good nps score or not you know a portion of it is clinical factors so it's not like you're just looking at one score and then using that to determine uh, whether our customers are having a good experience or not So I hope that answers that question. So the next question is from Vinay, uh, which is, what are the other sources to get patient time in real time other than feedback, and can we use real time data for data model? So I'm sorry, I actually don't seem to understand what the question completely means. Uh, if I think if the question is about uh, 
real time okay so let's talk about let, let me try and answer the question looking at it from a perspective of how can we use real time data so uh, real time data is is all about uh, Let's say that uh, you have an algorithm, and let's say it's going to predict something about the patient. That yes, this person is going to have a certain, uh, this person is likely to have a particular disease, and you have a real-time clinical data in front of you, and you want to do something with it. So, typically, uh, most most models that are used in hospital uh, are uh, either either a point of care kind of a thing, meaning that you need to know right now today that does this person have cancer, or it may be about predicting that okay this person is going to have uh, an advanced stage of the disease 10 years from now so uh, so typically it depends on how you want to use it in the hospital uh, so let me take another example suppose you have a patient in an icu and using say the waveforms of the patient the heartbeat and so on you want to say in a real time that yes is this patient starting to fall ill or not so there are models today that can definitely uh, alert you and say that yes there is a problem there is and you better go and uh, you know it can flash somewhere at the center and say that yes this patient should be looked at and start uh, trying trying to uh, recover the patient or something of that sort so th these things are there and even our own hospital we have it in a limited kind of a deployment and uh, i think it's possible to use those things and it is being used in fact so I hope uh, that answers that question. So the next question is from Anmol, uh, which is from where can we get data or case studies related to healthcare for practice? Uh, so I, I can't think of a very good immediate example, but uh, so, so, so there are a few public data sets. Uh, so, so there is this site, which I think is by University of Michigan or one of those things. So where they have uh, about 300 to 400 data sets, not just in healthcare, but all across the retail and many other sectors. And these are very well labeled. So for example, I think there's, there's, they have data sets even on cancer and uh, tumors and images, which are labeled as, uh, this is have a particular disease and so on. So you'll find data in places like those. And uh, I think a uh, lot of other uh, groups, especially, I would say especially in the US, UK, they've been pretty active to try and uh, put data out there. And uh, and the other way of getting data is that a lot of uh, their research papers, they're, they are uh, publishing, say, certain results out of the data that they have analyzed. So you could contact the authors of these papers by email and then ask them for the data, and they may be able to give you access in some way. And the only other way of getting such uh, access to case studies and research papers is you can go to scholar.google.com and you'll be able to see, uh, if you just search, you'll find a lot of uh, good case studies. And, uh, and and typically, if you see that a certain case study or a research paper has a lot of citations, then they, they need pretty strong papers and you may want to at least start with a few of uh, those. The other source that you can look at is uh, this uh, site called as Kaggle. So Kaggle is, Kaggle hosts a lot of competitions, and they have uh, and they had some recent competitions also. So I think in total about five six competitions they've had on healthcare. So that might be the really quick fix for you to look at some healthcare data to practice on. So uh, the next question is by Sunil Vishal, which is who owns the healthcare data, patients or hospital? So uh, see, I'm not I. I don't think I can give you a very fair answer to this question because uh, I'm not a medical legal expert. Uh, it it kind of depends on what data you're talking about. So, in in general, yes, in, by principle, yes, we'd like to say that patients own the data, and uh, in, but but the question is uh, how is this data going to be used? And uh, certain data tends to be more sensitive where patient consent is needed before doing an analysis, but in some cases. Uh, there may be cases where the hospital doesn't need to take the patient's consent to do something with it. So it depends on what data you're looking at. And I think uh, someone who is more well-versed, who is a medical law, uh, legal lawyer, can probably tell you the best answer to this particular question. And if you are looking at using a certain, uh, you know, acquiring a certain data or doing some sort of analysis, you need to consult uh, someone like it. And we consult medical legal experts before we do anything with data as well. So, the next question is by Rohit. 
So the question is, shouldn't be shouldn't it be a key concern with Watson that uh, integrating principles and conclusions from one population with judgments and principles to help us guide through cases with many unknowns? I find it very difficult to envision that any algorithm could be uh, that complex to be able to do that. So, so basically, I think the question is that how are you generalizing? Uh, how is, for example, Watson generalizing uh, treatment information, treatment recommendations of one population, and then how are we able to use it, say, in Indian population or a different uh, population for that matter? So, that's a pretty pertinent question, and. Uh, to you know, to try and address that, our doctors have actually uh, done a scientific study where they have compared Watson recommendations with our own, and broadly it has seen very high amount of uh, concordance. So, uh, but I think there needs to be a lot more study to really uh, conclude that yes, uh, it is good enough or not. And clearly, if there were, I mean, if there were a lot of factors that would cause a lot of difference to happen, then I think it would have been shown in the studies that we have conducted. But so far, it has been so far. I think it is promising the, the kind of uh, results that you see. So th this is anyway just the opinion that I am uh, giving you based on one study that is done, and there are more studies that are being conducted by Watson with uh, other hospitals in the world, and they may or may not come to the same conclusions. And I think we, we should all look forward to learning from that and then seeing how to build better healthcare uh, AI based uh, systems. So I hope that answers that question. So uh, I'm going to take, going to take uh, last two questions here. So one is, uh, so, so the questions by Amit uh, Varna and Deepu Dilip. So what is the level of accuracy for Watson in cancer? So, so that's a very important question. And uh, we are actually, uh, so I, I did talk about a study that we have uh, done earlier to kind of help assess that. Uh, so, and I think we have a follow-up study also that has come out recently. So, I and so I would say that it, it depends on the uh, cases that you look at. So, for breast cancer cancer cases, the uh, group of uh, 600 odd patients that we looked at, it was having a 90% uh, concordance between our doctor's predictions and what Watson predicted. And the other thing I'm going to show you is that uh, when, when you use the word, what is the level of accuracy? So, accuracy can mean many things for different people. So. For some people, uh, so the easiest way for us to assess it is to say that is it in concordance with our doctor's recommendations? But uh, but a different, uh, but another person might want to say, okay, if uh, if a patient uses recommendations given by Watson versus a patient who uh, is given recommendations given by the doctor, who is most likely to survive? Right. So that can be a different way for you to assess accuracy, and that's going to be a much harder and longer study for us to uh, look at. And uh, so the, the last question I'm going to take is, can we also use Vika in uh, Vika? So Vika is a, uh, actually a pretty old, uh, old but actually pretty good uh, Java-based uh, machine learning software. So can we use Vika in predictive modeling in healthcare, or in which area can we use Vika? So I think Vika, Vika is also pretty useful. So and uh, I, I think there have been a lot of applications that have been built on it. I, I can't think of any specific one in healthcare, but uh, there's no reason that you can't do that. So. Uh, so a lot of so so I for example I do a lot of coding in Python uh, and it is actually pretty useful for uh, a lot of these applications and you can use R you can use Python uh, there have been a lot of models built in uh, SAS and MATLAB as well but I don't see any reason why you can't use Vika as well so uh, so I guess that's the last question I have taken for the session and probably I can address some of the other questions uh, offline uh, later and uh, so so. Thanks, thanks for attending the webinar and uh, I had a really great time answering some of your questions and I hope that uh, this pulls some of uh, some of the aspiring data scientists to work in the field and uh, hope this has been useful for everyone. So thank you. Hi, so uh, I just wanted to say a big thank you to Karthik and Kutu Karamat and to Dr. Dave, and thank you to all of you for sort of joining in. Um, my father will be happy to be able to find this really productive and more webinar. So we hope we hope you all are well. Thank you